So in 2004, uh, George Miley uh, suggested to us that we should start doing some experiments uh, using CR39 detectors. And so we looked into it and uh, found out that CR39 is a polyallyl diglycocarbonate polymer that has been widely used in the inertial confinement fusion field as a solid state nuclear track detector. And its most common everyday use in our lives is that it's the lenses in our glasses. It's the plastic in the lenses. And what happens is when a charged particle uh, hits this plastic, it causes an ionization trail that's more sensitive to etching than the bulk. And after the experiment, all you have to do is just dump it into your uh, etching solution, uh, usually 6.5 normal sodium hydroxide at 60 degrees and etch it for six hours. And then you have these tracks that look like pits on the surface. And these tracks have a conical-like shape here. Uh, last year, a paper came out by Durrani discussing the weaknesses and strengths of solid-state nuclear track detectors. Uh, one of the strengths is that there's a small geometry, the trails of damage on the orders of nanometers and microns in diameter and length. Uh, long history and selectivity of track recording. Uh, these uh, solid-state nuclear track detectors can retain a record of the nuclear activity for billions of years. And that's advantageous in that when you can periodically uh, look at your detectors from time to time to look for evidence of other reactions. Uh, there's an existence of a threshold for registration. You have to have a certain charge and energy for them to uh, appear. Uh, these detectors are very rugged and simple to use. They're inexpensive. Uh, they have an integrating capability, meaning that when an event occurs, they're permanently stamped on the surface of the detector, so uh, you don't lose anything. Everything accumulates, so nothing can get averaged away. And they respond to both charged particles and neutrons. The weaknesses, of course, is that it does lack real-time capability. There is poor charge and energy discrimination. Even though the track size and shape depends upon the charge and mass of the particles, as well as the angle of incidence, there's significant overlap in the size distribution of the tracks due to the particles. And there's also variability in the solid-state nuclear track detectors. Environmental conditions and manufacturing procedures result in problems of precision and reproducibility from batch to batch. And there's a lack of theoretical understanding on how these some materials uh, are able to have tracks and others not. We weren't the first to do work with CR39 detectors. Other groups have done it. Uh, Richard Oriani and John Fisher uh, published a paper in 2002 in the Japanese Journal of Applied Physics. In their experiments, they had CR39 detectors above and below their cathodes. And what they saw was that track density in their electrolysis experiments were significantly higher than in their controls. Uh, Andre Lipson and uh, others uh, did some work where they were electrochemically loading these heterostructures composed of uh, gold, palladium, and palladium oxide with deuterium. And once they were done with those experiments, they took those cathodes out, placed them in contact with CR39, and cycled the temperature. And they saw tracks consistent with uh, 2.5 uh, to 3 MeV protons and 0.5 to 1.5 MeV tritons. They also did some in situ experiments using 50 micron thick palladium foil. Uh, in contact with the CR39. These were light water experiments, and they showed that the tracks were concentrated in areas where the cathode was in contact with the detector. And they also did some experiments where they placed uh, aluminum and copper spacer materials between the uh, detector and the palladium foil and reported on the emission of 11 to 16 MeV alphas and 1.7 MeV protons. So this is our experimental configuration. We put the uh, CR39 in close proximity to the cathode, and the reason for that is that charged particles can't travel very far in water. Uh, here, our linear, linear energy transfer occurs for these particles in water, and you can see that even if you have 10 micron uh, thickness of water, you can cut down two MeVs of uh, the uh, energy of the alphas. Our first experiment involved nickel screen in the, whoops, in the absence of uh, uh, electric or magnetic field, and we did not see any particles. Instead, we saw the impression of the nickel screen. And I showed this to Stan, and he suggested, well, maybe what you're seeing is uh, damage due to x-rays, because you know, based on the work we did with the photographic film and the uh, earlier a germanium detector experiments. So he suggested that we place our uh, detector with uh, another screen material in front of our XRD, and that's what we did, and you can clearly see the impression of the copper screen uh, that was in contact with the CR39. And it's a lot sharper than what we see with ours, but here the XRD has a very co uh, coherent collimated beam, whereas uh, with the, our experiments, where our uh, radiation emissions are in all directions, anisotropic. Uh, we did a similar experiment where we uh, exposed the CR39 uh, to a cesium source, and we saw the same kind of damage we saw with our nickel screen. So we believe this kind of damage is, is representative of uh, X-ray and gamma ray emissions. 
However, when we put the nickel screen in a magnetic field, that's when we started to see the particles. Here you can see the uh, outer uh, eyelets of the nickel screen and where the palladium plated inside the eyelet, you see a very high density of particles. This was a silver wire experiment that was done in the magnetic field. You see the damage is uh, associated with the cathode. Now this looks like an awful lot of damage, but you have to remember this experiment went on for two weeks. So everything is adding up in that two week period. At higher magnification, you can see we have small tracks as well as large tracks. Uh, some of the tracks are elliptical in shape and some are circular. And we have these things called triple tracks. And this triple track was actually brought to our attention by Gary Phillips, who's retired of the Naval Research Laboratory, and we'll talk about that later, the significance of those tracks. Uh, but what Gary told us is that a triple track is indicative of a reaction that gives off three particles of equal mass and energy. So our features due to background or to a particle. So here on the left-hand side, we have tracks uh, on CR39 that was exposed to an americium alpha source. And here's tracks from our co-deposition experiment. Here we have focused the optics on the surface of the uh, CR39, and the tracks are dark in color. When you focus down inside, you see this bright spot in the middle. And that bright spot is caused by the tip of the cone acting like a little lens when the detector is backlit. And so dark on the surface, bright spot in the center, those are diagnostic features of a nuclear generated track. And you see we see the same things with our uh, tracks. Dark on the surface, bright spot in the middle. Features that are due to uh, uh, background or chemical damage, whoops, uh, are uh, shallow, bright in color, they show no contrast. We did a series of control experiments. One of the things we did is we exposed our, C our CR39 to our cell components in the absence of electrolysis. We let it go for the same amount of time uh, as we did an electrolysis experiment. We saw no pits. So this told us that the uh, tracks were not due to radioactive contamination of the cell components. We did electrolysis in the absence of the palladium chloride and saw no tracks. So this told us that the tracks were not due to the impingement of deuterium gas on the surface of the CR39. We replaced the palladium chloride with copper chloride in an electrolysis ex experiments. Uh, there you have uh, at the cathode uh, metal plating out in the presence of deuterium gas. At the anode you have chlorine and oxygen gas evolution. The only significant difference is that palladium absorbs deuterium, copper does not. We saw tracks with the palladium system, we did not see any tracks with the copper system. So what this tells us is that the tracks are not due to chemical reaction of electrochemically generated deuterium, oxygen, or chlorine gases, nor are they due to the dendrites of the metal piercing into the CR39. We replaced the lithium chloride with potassium chloride and still saw tracks that told us that lithium was not required to generate the tracks. We replaced the heavy water with light water. We still saw some tracks with light water, but they were like four orders of magnitude less than what we saw in the heavy water system. And light water does contain deuterium in it, so it's quite possible that we're still seeing palladium-deuterium interactions. We also uh, replaced the CODEP with the palladium wire. We did see some tracks with the palladium wire. They were not homogeneously distributed as we saw with the uh, palladium chloride system, uh, which told us that some sites of the palladium were more active than others, and this has been reported by other folks as well. And we did some experiments uh, placing a mylar between the CR39 and the detector to, and told us that the energies of the, detect of the tracks were on the order of one MeV. And uh, we did also did some track modeling that supported those results. This is the results of the mylar experiments. Here we placed the six micron mylar between the cathode and the uh, CR39 detector. So the CR39 detector is actually on the outside of the cell. Uh, the uh, mylar will cut off 0.45 MeV protons, 0.55 MeV tritons, 1.4 MeV uh, helium-3, and 1.45 MeV alphas. Uh, you can still see we saw tracks, and uh, the fact that the CR39 is on the outside of the cell tells us, that the, again, that the tracks are not due to chemical or mechanical damage. Okay, why won't it go? Uh, we did some track modeling. Uh, the uh, track test program is freeware. It was developed by these fellows here, Nikizik and uh, Yu. Uh, the input parameters for this modeling, you put in your energy of your alpha and MeV, uh, incident angle between 30 and 90 degrees, your etch rate, which you can measure, uh, which is uh, in microns per hour, and the etch time in hours. And uh, this is the relationship between the uh, track etch rate to the bulk etch rate, and this is the equation that's used in the program. And here we modeled this particular track here. It's kind of like a pear-shaped track. 
Uh, if we put an incident energy of 1.3 MeV, uh, uh, incident angle 35 degrees, etch rate of 1.25, and etch time of six hours, you get the same kind of pear-like shape. Uh, if you measure some of the parameters, uh, D1 is the distance between the e back edge and uh, the uh, bright spot in the middle. Uh, the computer analysis says it should be 5.59 microns. We measure 5.34, which is a pretty good agreement. The uh, major axis, uh, the computer says 9.32, we measure 9.36, and the minor axis 7.68, which is the same as what we measured. So it's pretty darn good agreement. To simulate the effect of water on uh, the shapes of the tracks, we did an experiment where we took the americium source and we placed sheets of mylar between it and the detector. And uh, in the absence of mylar, the energy of the uh, particles on the order of 5.5 MeV, and you can see we have uh, circular tracks as well as these uh, elliptical and torpedo-shaped tracks. And those elliptical and torpedo-shaped tracks are coming in at an angle uh, less than 90 degrees into the CR39. When you put an 18 microns of mylar between the detector and uh, the uh, americium source, the energy of the alphas has now been reduced to 1.92, and you can see we have primarily circular tracks. And that means that uh, these tracks uh, are, are caused by uh, particles coming in at a 90 degree angle. These are the only particles that have enough energy to go through all that um, mylar. And it's the same effect we're seeing with our uh, experiments, our electrolysis experiments, because the particles have to go through water, and that slows them down. And here is the case if you have 24 microns a mile, your energy of your alpha particles on the order of 1.09 MeV. And again, you see very circular tracks and some smaller ones as well. And here we compare our co-deposition uh, tracks seen here with 1 MeV alpha tracks. You can see we have the circular ones which we see in our experiments. And you see this one here looks very much similar to that one, and this track looks very similar to that one. And I'll turn the presentation on to Larry.